Jerome Powell tells the markets exactly what they want to hear, but they don't want to hear it. That's the feeling we come off uh, with today uh, after something of a strange session in global financial markets. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And the stage has been set in something of a different way here than we've seen in the better part of three months as we get this sense that the markets did not respond to what the Fed chair seemed to be saying, despite the fact that he was giving them exactly what they might have asked for. And indeed, the thing that they have been cheering since mid-April. So the question now, as we consider where this heads next, is of course, what does it mean that the markets are not responding positively? And is it finally time to start worrying about the cumulative impact of tightening having produced the economic slowdown that so far many have expected, but of course has not actually materialized. So that is what we're going to focus on here today, especially since we stand just ahead of key economic data from China that will suggest if in fact the U.S. economy is finally getting to a worrying enough place that the Fed is becoming more urgent in talking up interest rate cuts, then we are operating without a safety net because support from the other major engines of economic growth, China, of course, one of the two, is probably not forthcoming. So first, let's do a bit of stage setting and consider what the markets have been doing with Fed rate cut expectations over the past three months. This is, of course, a chart that we ought to be familiar with at this point. In the blue is the S&P 500. In the gray is the number of uh, interest rate cuts implied for this year in Fed funds futures. In the yellow is the tally for 2025. The orange line is the sum of the two, essentially reflecting the depth of the overall rate cut cycle from now through the end of next year. The sort of actionable window to speculate on where the Fed might go and what it might do and at what speed. We can see here that since mid-April, the markets heard the Fed's higher for longer narrative as it was bemoaning that disinflation was stalling and said, all right, fine, you're good for one cut this year, but that means you're going to have to catch up next year, which means that you're going to have to cut more, not just move the cuts from 2024 to 2025, uh, but increase how many of them you are likely to do because the economy will have turned uh, to a point where inflation will have fallen to a point where you need to play catch up. And so what we see here is mid-April, we're looking at 76 basis points in cuts, so three rate cuts on the whole. This, of course, is exactly where we bottom for stock markets after a pullback as this tally starts to build out, and we can see it's coming as the view for 2025 grows more dovish whereas the view for 20 to 24 continues to basically call for one cut and no more. So clearly here, the markets are enjoying the prospect of cheaper money in the future. As we go from 76 basis points in uh, cumulative cuts to, to now 132 basis points, essentially doubling or nearly doubling the amount of easing uh, that's uh, on the menu over a three-month window, we see stocks clearly enjoy what they are seeing. But of course, the key question was, is this a thing to celebrate ultimately? And what we immediately turn to there is, of course, why 
there is a sense in markets that the Fed is making a policy mistake by delaying rate cuts, why it is that not uh, just are the markets moving these 80 basis points into next year, but they are significantly increasing scope for easing. And that is, of course, because U.S. economic data has indeed shown signs of deterioration relative to forecast. We can see here's that mid-April turn in the stock market. Here's mid-April here. There's mid-April right there. What we see is that U.S. economic data starts to underperform relative to forecasts on this measure from Citigroup. That, of course, suggests that indeed the Fed is getting closer to cutting rates. And the reason it is, is because the economy is finally starting to weaken to a point where that looks appropriate. Inflation, of course, has started to uh, come in once again. But even so, the message from the Fed until today was, we have the luxury of a strong labor market, the economy is doing relatively well, we don't need to cut in a hurry, we can wait to really make sure inflation is on the downward trajectory that we want it to be on, we don't need to act now. That was very different from the message that uh, we got from Jerome Powell in his semi-annual congressional testimony before uh, the Senate Banking Committee today. He'll go to the House tomorrow and uh, face the Financial Services Committee there. But the message is probably going to be generally unchanged, give or take some more fiery questions in the Q&A, perhaps. But the tone that he's adopted is very clearly more even-handed than just, it's okay, we can wait. The labor market is still strong. In fact, Powell pointedly said, we are eyeing other risks beyond just inflation. If we were to cut too late, that could unduly harm the economy. And the labor market is no longer overheated. All of which seems to say, the rate cuts are coming sooner. We are reaching a more immediate window for action. And of course, the markets are already overwhelmingly priced with about an 80% uh, probability for a rate cut in September. That, of course, leaves just one minute uh, meeting in the middle, the July 31st meeting. There is no uh, Fed policy uh, meeting in August. So if the Fed doesn't cut this very month, well, then it's going to cut, according to market expectations, at the very next meeting. And the tone from the Federal Reserve in today's um, Powell commentary seems to be, yes, we feel the need to make a move. Because the economy is starting to show the kind of signs of wear and tear that would be consistent with lasting disinflation. Now, markets, of course, like to speculate on rate cuts, as we see here. But their actual onset is a very different story, because when the Fed or any central bank is finally beckoned into action, it isn't because things are going well. It's because something has become so intolerable in the economic outlook. Something has become so seemingly negative that the central bank has to move. And so this, of course, starts to paint a picture of U.S. economic downturn on the horizon with an immediacy that is growing more palpable. At the same time, what we are about to see appears to be evidence that the other major engines of global economic growth will not make for much of an offset if the U.S. does slow down. Data uh, incoming from China expected to show that consumer prices grew at just 0.4% year on year in June. The wholesale inflation uh, measure, the producer price index, expected to decline yet again 
You can see here it's been below zero for quite some time now. And this will be a little bit of an improvement, down 0.8% versus uh, down 1.4% in May, but nevertheless, still negative. Both of these inflation metrics converging on zero. What's more, if we look at the economic surprise index out of China, over the same three months that we've seen things weaken in the U.S., we've likewise seen them weaken in China. This is it right here. In fact, at this point, we can see we're through the zero line on this economic surprise index, which suggests that now not only is data souring relative to forecasts, it is now tending to undershoot them rather than beating by a narrowing margin, which would be this down move still above zero sort of uh, setting for the index. And so we are setting up here not just to converge on zero in the expected way, but perhaps with even weaker outcomes, which of course speaks to the very precarious situation that the world's second largest economy continues to see. For four consecutive quarters now, we have seen that real GDP, that is economic growth adjusted for inflation, has outpaced nominal GDP, that is economic growth before that inflation adjustment. This is not how this is supposed to work. It's supposed to be that you get nominal growth, you then subtract from it inflation to get a real picture. If you're subtracting inflation and you end up with a higher number than before you did that subtraction, then the inflation coefficient is negative. And that, of course, is a terrible indictment of economic conditions in the country because Needless to say, things do not go on discount when there is demand to buy them. When you see that the inflation coefficient is something to the tune of over 1%, now uh, approaching 1.5% of quarterly GDP growth points, what you're looking at is essentially an economy that is so anemic, where demand is so weak, that essentially the entire economy is on discount. And this is ostensibly because there isn't demand to bid up the price level. And so instead what there is, is discounting to try to lure some level of demand to return. If we get another weak set of CPI and PPI numbers, that would only reinforce the view that in an environment where the U.S. might finally be starting to feel the pinch from all that Fed tightening, China is no closer to rebuilding momentum. At the same time, the situation in the Eurozone is also starting to look a bit worrying. What we're looking here is the latest set of purchasing manager index numbers, and we can see here the top economies here, France, that shows continued contraction. This, of course, still works in the logic of PMIs, so above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. The further you go above 50, the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. What we see is in June, the economy in France shrank. That part was as expected, but it shrank at a faster rate than it did in May. Whereas expectations called for a bit of an improvement. Germany, the largest economy in the Eurozone seem to slip back to close to neutral on growth, just a hair above 50, whereas expectations were for much more robust growth, 52.7. In fact, an acceleration versus May. 
that of course gives us a troubling view on the composite where growth is now slipped to a three month low, suggesting that after the Eurozone experienced the shallow recession in late 2023 and then saw a period of catch up in the first half of 2024, momentum is fading. This, of course, is a very precarious place to be. Between the US, the Eurozone, and China, you have 50% of global economic growth. And that's before you account for the fact that the rest of the world, the other 50%, tends to rely on demand from the big three in order to have growth. So think of the US and Canada and Mexico, Central and Eastern Europe, even Nordic Europe and the Eurozone, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, some parts of South America, Africa, when it comes to China. And of course, China itself is dependent on demand from the US and the Eurozone, given its role in the middle of the global supply chain, where raw materials come into China, are variously finished and semi-finished, and then shipped on, ultimately, to service US and Eurozone demand, for the most part. Now, if the Eurozone is once again becoming weak, if China remains anemic, as the CPI and PPI data this week is likely to show, and the Fed is signaling that the U.S. economy has finally turned a corner in the direction of a slower setting, well then, a global recession, or at least the fears of a global recession, are probably not far behind. And this perhaps starts to explain how it was that when Powell spoke today and seemingly told the markets what they liked to hear, rate cuts, rate cuts, rate cuts, stocks could not make much of that message. They closed very little change after retreating from the daily highs. The dollar rose, crude oil fell, Gold and silver struggled to build higher. All of it seemingly saying, yeah, maybe we liked rate cuts yesterday, but now it seems like a global recession concern is on the horizon. And the more immediate these rate cuts look, and the more anemic China and the Eurozone appear, the more acutely worried markets ought to be. If we look at a breakdown between global, major, and emerging markets on this uh, economic surprise index measure, we see that data from the G10 and the overall total is already below zero. It is already tending to disappointment. All three are trending lower. There's still a bit of... Uh, green on the menu with the emerging market gauge above water. But that, of course, tends to follow, not lead, because again, these tend to be economies clustered in here. This vendor area. And so there is some lag before slowdown here echoes as lost demand here. So it makes sense that these are leading and these are following. But the way that this is stacking up now, the situation starts to look increasingly concerning. As a matter of fact, the global version of these PMI numbers from S&P Global suggest that May and June marked something of a turn. These June PPP. PMI numbers here suggest maybe some sort of a catch up, some sort of a ramp up that we saw from late last year has now crested. And so whereas the story sounded very comfortable, not surprisingly, stocks bottomed uh, in October of last year and have rallied since. 
The narrative here was that of incoming rate cuts with improving global growth, a kind of Goldilocks scenario. Well, if the rate cuts are coming, but global growth has stopped improving, it's a very different world indeed that we are looking at. One that bodes ill for stocks and growth sensitive commodities like crude oil and copper, say, and is much more supportive of bonds, the dollar, and perhaps the precious metal space. Though how a stronger dollar diffuses that and makes that less of a pronounced move higher, that, that remains to be seen so far. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, just after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at where uh, Wall Street closed and where it might be heading thereafter. I'm on with Victor Jones tomorrow for The Price of Truth. I'm on with Chris again for Futures Power Hour on Friday. Back on with Victor and Tom for First Call Sundays. Writing for the News and Insights portion of TastyLive.com and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter at Ilias Pivak. Thanks very much for joining. Macro Money's back tomorrow. <laughs>